welcome everyone to the session of unlocking open source community's potential community handbook best practices to foster inclusivity and diversity hi my name is jaskira singh and i'm working as an open source strategist and tech writer to the chaos which is a project under the next foundation and today i'm co-facilitating this session Yes, hi everybody. My name is Naritzi Sanchez. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm currently the Senior Open Source Program Manager at GitLab. Formerly, I've been the President and Chairperson at the GNOME Foundation, and I help start Endless, which creates a Linux-based computer for people with little to no internet access. It's great to be here with you today. For your information, I would be leading the first half of this session and the second half would be led by Nuritsi. Let's get started. So throughout this session, you can expect us, uh, like we would be discussing about what is a community handbook and why is it important. Secondly, we would also be talking about the components of a community handbook. Last but not the least, and how you can exactly join the movement. Awesome, let's get dive into it. So talking about the attributes of a community handbook, it gets generally divided into four different phases. Documenting the processes, this is where you have to define all the processes involved inside the community. And this is the place where uh, the, the newcomers and existing community members can understand that what all processes are involved inside the communities in order to omit any kind of leadership. Centralizing the information is very important as well. There should only be a single source of authority for finding how to do things inside the community. You don't have to replicate other things at different places. It just should be that the things are kept at one place. Onboarding the newcomers is again the important phase where you actually tell the newcomers or even the existing community members that how they can participate inside the community, that what all workflows or the project history they have to understand before contributing accessibility and easily searchable. This is the thing which where we have to keep diversity in the mind, taking into account the some of the user experience. Next slide, please. Community handbook also enables diversity. With this, it enables to the geographic diversity. Like this is where we document processes that enables asynchronous working across different time zones and people can generally utilize the translators or some kind of those tools to help them understand it better. Accessibility, and this is where we keep those guidelines in the mind that enables people with disability to access the content better. Inclusive language uh, is, is again the important thing uh, inside the community handbook. And this is where you don't have to use the phrases or sentences which actually affects the uh, certain group of people. Community handbook also creates transparency and openness. Here are three different examples of how it does. It empowers contributor space. People should know that what you are working upon. It also holds community accountable to their practices. For example, that suppose if any community is working on some kind of feature or a bug and they want some kind of user input, it is a, I'm, I'm like, it kind of just a feedback from the user end. So, but for this thing, they have uh, drafted few of the key points inside the community handbook, but they are not following up that. And they're just using uh, common public channels just to communicate and getting user feedback. So this is where actually the challenge comes. So you just have to stick on what you write inside the community handbook or else just update the handbook accordingly so that people can know that what the processes are and how they can participate inside the community. It also allows people to replicate process in, the, in other communities. The world should know that what you are working upon and they can just adapt the things from your uh, input, whatever they find relevant. You don't have to replicate everything. Here we would be talking about the <clears throat> two different uh, community handbooks where I would be discussing about the chaos project and the GitLab handbooks would be uh, like, you would be hearing about the GitLab handbooks from the 
awesome. So uh, when the kiosk, uh, I mean, like, when the kiosk was established uh, as a part of the Linux Foundation project, there were a lot many discussions around the community that how and what all things are required inside the community to adhere towards the processes or lay down the processes. So there were a lot of discussions around uh, in order to adapt the uh, community handbook for the chaos project. So for your information, uh, this project was uh, proposed inside the Google Season of Docs. So Google Season of Docs is one of the uh, program run by the Google where technical writers, work with the open source organizations, help them build better documentation for the projects as well as for the communities. So I was lucky enough to get accepted as one of the aspirant uh, with the Chaos project where I contributed towards the Chaos Community Handbook and that was super fun. Uh, once my proposal was accepted, there were a lot of discussions around uh, what best tool to adopt, uh, like what, what all documentation tools we can go with. And we finally ended up using the GitHub. Even it's, it's not even my favorite, but it's something which actually uh, provides you with a better user interfaces, uh, some, some uh, key, uh, key features we could say uh, with some better editing tools, uh, even like it's, it's more user-friendly uh, when it comes to uh, working with different tech writers at the same time. So it's really amazing. Uh, the community handbook of the chaos has been divided into four different sections. It talks about about. Uh, this is where uh, the mission, the values of the chaos project, the leadership involved inside the community. Uh, like you would be getting all of the uh, information regarding these things under the about section. Community section is more specific towards the chaos project, and this is where. Uh, you will find the information about the initiatives or the programs the Kiosk has been running around. Uh, the contributing is again, is very important for any of the open source community. And this is uh, where people can know that how they can participate inside the community. Uh, like they can contribute towards designing, uh, the documentation, the development, even for outreach. So you just have to uh, draft the workflows or the processes involved while contributing inside the community. Since a, a chaos project has been participating in various development programs, so uh, the mentorship section basically covers about those programs in which the chaos has participated. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really great. Just have a look over it. Awesome. So the section, the, the, the page you are seeing part of here is the, basically the snapshot taken from the chaos community handbook. The left side of this context is the left navbar, which uh, contains the different sections, like about here is this section, and the chaos history, values, roadmap, these all are the subsections. The central part of the page is the exact information which you want to uh, provide to your users. So if you could see, here is a visual identity uh, I have drafted for the chaos history. And yes, again, it is always suggested to have something like, uh, uh, I'm like just giving the context of a page with some visual identities or visual images so that people who don't find the reading the whole uh, like whole specific page can understand from the visual identity like here the chaos history uh, you could find that how chaos evolved and how it has transitioned from different phases so this is always interesting to like just uh, have inside your comedy hand So this is again the second page taken from the Chaos Community Handbook, uh, which talks about the uh, leadership processes. Since Chaos has three different types of leadership inside the community, so this uh, specific page actually demonstrates that how one can get involved inside the community, or, or I mean, like how one can exactly avail leadership inside the community. Similarly, we also have different pages, uh, like if you could see on the left navbar. We have terminology used inside the chaos project, the roadmap, the values. So feel free to just surf it around and it's gonna be super amazing. So now you could be hearing about the uh, GitLab handbook from the university. Awesome, thank you so much, Jess Garrett. Hi everybody. So at GitLab, we are an open core company. 
So that means that we are built around an open source project. And that means that it's really important for us to work alongside our community. From its very beginning, GitLab had this transparency and openness in mind, which Jessica had mentioned before. And it's part of the reason why from the very beginning, we adopted a handbook. At GitLab, whenever somebody onboards as a team member, their part of the onboarding process walks them through the handbook and how to contribute because everybody will need to maintain their own page or contribute towards their team pages. And contributing to the handbook does require editing through merge requests or MRs. And while this can seem a little bit scary to people who are not developers and not familiar with merge requests already, it's actually very easy. For example, in the screenshot, you can see how there are different ways to edit the page. You can open it in Web IDE or open in a static site editor or view the source. And this provides different ways for people to do so. Um, I personally like the format where it basically looks like a Word document to me uh, with Markdown. And so I've become familiar with using merge requests and cannot and can edit the um, handbook very easily now and also other web pages that require, you know, merge requests. And um, for me, it's already unlocked other things that I can contribute to. With our GitLab handbook, one of the things that's really important is to have um, a table of contents and a search bar to help people navigate. The handbook, the GitLab handbook is over 2000 pages longer, you know, has over 2000 pages, which is a lot of content. <laughs> so it's really important for people to be able to search through it easily. As we talk about hand, uh, about updates, we have this thing called code owners for each page or each section of pages. And what this is, is basically um, people who are designated to uh, make sure that the content stays relevant and um, that it's constantly updated with the latest information. It's kind of like having a project maintainer where somebody, you know, is, is actively working on this, where they get the final say on whether something stays in or, you know, is left out, et cetera. And I want to mention that this is distinct from GitLab Docs. GitLab Docs focuses on product documentation, and the GitLab Handbook focuses on process documentation. Um, each team has to maintain this. Here on this snapshot, you can see the people group, engineering, marketing, sales, finance, product, legal, everybody um, must maintain their pages. An example of this, just so that you can see a little bit further, is the open source program page that I maintain. On it, you can see things like how to reach us, what we're working on, what our goals are for this quarter, or what metrics we use to make sure that the program is succeeding. It also goes into really detailed things like what product SKUs we use for the various programs that we run, or you know, who qualifies for the programs, etc. The point of this is to have so much detail that if, for whatever reason, a key person has to transition away, somebody else can step in and take over. And this, with community with communities, is really important because a lot of us are really worried about the bus factor. Basically, um, what that means is like if somebody gets hit by a bus and you know can no longer collaborate. Um, if there are core maintainers that people are worried that if they burn out or, you know, just have a life change and can't contribute anymore, like what will happen to the open source project? And by having such detailed documentation, it again allows for smoother transitions or for more people to be able to help out, for more delegation to be possible. Um, so this can, in that, so community handbooks in that way can even help towards uh, preventing burnout or, or helping with that and easing transitions. At GitLab, we have a handbook-first culture. 
And what that means is that you always respond with a link. If you can't find a link with the information, or if you can't find the information and provide a link, then you need to write the information in the handbook. And what this means is that it gets people in the habit of one, making sure that the handbook is updated, that it's easy to understand, but also that it's easy to find. Because maybe the information does exist on some obscure page, but nobody's ever going to find it. So by having everybody in the community constantly linking to the places and making sure that you know, it's easy to find, um, it enables people to just be able to jump right in themselves and, and search and find what they need. Okay, so hopefully now Jessica Red and I have given you um, a little bit of background about you know, what it is, why it's important, and some examples of the ones that we're working on. And now we're going to cover how you actually begin creating a community handbook. The first thing I want to mention here is that we are still defining the standards for what a community handbook is. We're creating templates and guidelines for other communities to be able to quickly and easily create their own. Jessica Rett and I first uh, started talking about this topic at MozFest earlier this year. We had lots of people interested, but people always kind of got stuck at the how do I get started and, you know, what specific examples are there? So we joined IEEESA Open, the documentation and curation team, and we're working on this. We'll share some of what we've started to talk about already, and we invite you to join us to keep defining these. So the first thing that we all agree that should be part of your process for creating a handbook is creating buy-in among your community. To do this, you want to document your proposal in a public way. So that might be in issues or a wiki, um, something that allows anybody to be able to view it. And then you want to request input from the community. This, they might be able to do that by commenting on the issue itself. Or you might want to create um, an email and post it on the mailing list, inviting people to go view it and give your feedback. Once that's done in the first, you have some ideas about what the community thinks and, you know, maybe have started to iterate a little bit on it you want to get formal approval from the governing body. This might be the board of directors, an executive leader, some other leader within the community. And this just gives your proposal and um, you know, this whole process a bit more legitimacy. You'll then set up a working group or tap into a relevant program. The one that Jessica mentioned was Google Season of Docs. And um, you want to establish regular meeting times, maybe once or twice a month um, or every week, you can decide. During that process, you want to regularly update the community so that they continue to give you feedback. The more that the community feels that they're able to contribute to defining this for, for you know, the community handbook for their community, the more they're likely to actually adopt it in the end. And then you want to just throughout the process employ change management skills to roll this out. And I wanted to specifically include this terminology, change management, because again, it's a skill that we can all learn to help us um, be leaders and be able to uh, have communities adopt big changes. What this might mean is, you know, you announce it at um, an annual board meeting as and have people vote on it, or um, it might be also training influencers to update the handbook so that then they can also train other members of the community. There are many different things you can do, and I encourage you to read more about change management skills to improve your own. As you are deciding what tool to use, we, we don't wanna give hard recommendations, um, but we will 
give you some desirable characteristics to keep in mind. The first is that your, the tool you use should be searchable. It should also be accessible, visual, user-friendly, and it should have version control. Because the worst thing would be for somebody to delete all the pages you've worked on and not be able to get it back. So uh, make sure that you can revert changes. Some of the tools that we recommend looking into are GitLab pages, GitBook, GitHub pages. There are many others, um, but these are some that we encourage you to look into first. When you think about crafting your handbook and adding various topics, these are some things that we think should definitely be included. The first is something about the community and about the project. So what's the mission, the vision, the values, the history, the governance model, and the code of conduct? There should also be something about the specific teams and groups and how to onboard onto each team what specific processes they follow. There should also be a sort of meta topic about the handbook itself, because again, you're trying to encourage everybody to contribute. So you want people to understand when the handbook is used, how to update it, um, and, and the whole process around it. And then consider adding something about the social factor. So in case somebody comes upon your handbook how do they meet other community members and what tools do you use to communicate? How can they talk to other community members as they consider making improvements to the handbook page? Another thing that you'll need to do as you create your community handbook is establish writing style guidelines. So keep the following in mind as you do that. The first is inclusive language, which again, Jessica Rett mentioned before, but I just want to reiterate how important this is. And it includes things like not using acronyms that you know, people may not know and feel either, you know, just like they can't contribute because they don't know what's going on. Um, or things like using the same gendered pronouns all the time and not being inclusive of others. Um, and also things like using certain vocabulary that might be exclusive. So try to make sure that when you're writing, it's made so that anybody can easily understand it and you're not using, um, you know, vocabulary that, that is a little bit difficult for, for people to understand. You also want to keep in mind accessibility and Jess Barrett and I have been, men, have been asked about this specifically a few times in other presentations. So we have some tips, we have a, a link to some helpful resources around how to um, write with accessibility in mind. Um, at the end, we'll provide a, a link for you to follow in case you're interested on that. And then the other thing is just to keep in mind your tone and voice for the handbook so that it's consistent throughout. How are updates handled? This is something that is really important for you to um, instill in your community early on. So as I mentioned before, there's a handbook first culture. So this is helping everybody get into the mindset of responding with a link. And then also considering adding those code owners or maintainers to just add an extra layer of accountability and responsibility where you know they're in charge of making sure that their sections are updated or that they can have a little bit of um, or can have input into what should go into their section or not. One moment, slides are falling apart. Here we go. <laughs> All right. The next section is just really how you can join the community handbook movement. We hope that we've gotten you excited about this and we'd really like you to join us. Here is a QR code that you can scan and what it will lead you, lead you to are slide decks that we have um, with links to the various resources that we've mentioned throughout the presentation. And um, we also, as I mentioned, are, are working on, um, as part of a uh, 
the IEEE essay open community. And so we invite you to define the community handbook standards with us. The other thing that you can help us do is coin the term so that people understand exactly what we mean by community handbook and that it's different than the regular product documentation that already exists. And then we invite you to spread the word in your communities. Feel free to copy any of the slide decks that we already have to pitch the idea further. We also welcome other outreach ideas. So feel free to connect with myself or with Jessicaette on LinkedIn or Twitter, and just let us know what you think. With that, um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of resources, links to the pages that we've shown as screenshots here, and we hope that these will be useful for you as you're creating your own handbook. Thank you so much for joining our session, and we will see you around. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much.